worship together this morning. Sing with us. Just a closer walk with thee. 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 Jesus is mine. Just a closer walk with thee. Just a closer walk with thee. But thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to A closer walk with thee. Just 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 a closer walk with thee. Daily walking close to thee. suffering and 
the same, a prodigal return. All my hope is in Jesus. Thank God that yesterday's gone. All my sins are forgiven. by the blood I'm no stranger to the prison I've worn shackles and chains but I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back, I'll never be the same. That's why I sing, all my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. forgiven I've been washed by the blood there's a kind of thing that just breaks a man break him down to his knees God, I've been broken more than a time or two, yes, Lord. Then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. Come on and sing, all my hope is in Jesus. gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. Come on and sing. All my hope is in Jesus. And I've, I've been washed by the blood. Oh, Father, we just want to thank you, Father, for the forgiveness that we have and to thank you and acknowledge that we know that it was through your blood. And Father, as we prepare even this week to just get our minds and our hearts set upon an empty grave father but before that grave came a death come a wrath of God poured out father we just want to acknowledge and thank you thank the son and thank the Holy Spirit father for all that you've done in our hearts and in our lives in Jesus name amen you may be seated We're finishing the book of Judges today. Every man did what was right in, his, in their own eyes. We're finishing this book and uh, looking forward to Easter. 
But I want to remind us of last week. Remember last week we dealt with the... Um, How we dealt with the wrath of God last week because what happened, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of God. God turned them over to their enemy. They cried out to God. But remember what happened last week that was different than the other times? God refused to deliver them. Remember that? So we didn't come to the end of what took place. Okay, Remember, they owned their sin. They repented of their sin and they turned from their false gods to God. They did that, but God didn't deliver them. What happened? This is what happened. Israel went and recruited a judge. His name was Jephthah. He's the one that made a bad vow. Cost him his daughter's life. But they went and recruited Jephthah and it's interesting, after they recruited him, and then he began to deliver them, that the Bible said the Spirit of God came upon him. So what I want to say is this. God did respond to their repentance, just not like he had previously. It was just different this time. Today we're going to look at the life of Samson. Think about this statement. Where Gideon did not think he could do anything, Samson thought he could do everything. Gideon did not think he could do anything, Samson thought he could do everything. But this is what I want us to see. Really, this one thing today from Samson's life I want us to see. And I've got it phrased two different ways, and you pick the one you like best. I think the latter is the most accurate. God uses imperfect people to accomplish His will. God uses imperfect people to accomplish His will. Or you might say it like this. Imperfect people will never derail the will of God. Imperfect people will never derail the will of God. The will of God will always ultimately be performed. As we begin in chapter 3, we're going to look at chapters 13 through 16. Don't panic, we'll be out by 2 o'clock. No, just kidding, just kidding. Really, I'm just kidding for those that are here for the first time. We'll be here. We, we won't be here. We're going to move quickly. In chapter 13, this is what we see, though. Again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord after they've had some rest, after they've had some peace underneath Jephthah. They did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. Would you think about this? Have you ever been in a position to where you needed to be delivered, provided for, and you needed God to act quickly? The children of Israel are in that position and God's showing up at a home where the lady cannot have children. They need God to answer quickly and God is starting at conception. You ever felt that way? You ever felt like you needed God to do something now and He's going to start at conception? God, was there not a teenager you could have used? Was there not a young adult? You're going to start way back here. I mean, prior to the birth of the baby. You're going to start at the very beginning. God, really? Have you ever felt that way? Children of Israel didn't know that was going on. That's what was happening. So they come, and then they come to him, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the to the woman, to the wife, and said to her, Indeed, now you are bearing, I'm in verse 3, and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink, and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, so I want you to think about this before I read verse 5. I want you to think about this. From the beginning of Samson's life, God's sovereign will has been there. His purpose, His plan. 
from his birth, from before his birth, God is involved. And the angel of the Lord says to the mama, not only for her not to drink wine or similar drink or to eat anything unclean, but he also says, but behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. I'm raising this baby up and he's going to deliver them. I'm going to do this with him. But a Nazarite was what? It three things in the Nazarite vow. They would not drink wine, they would not cut their hair, and they would not defile themselves with anything that was dead. Numbers specifically talks about dead family members. Anything that was dead. So, then the husband, the wife tells the husband, and then he prays in verse 8. Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, Oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent to come to us again and teach us what we shall do for the child who will be born. You know, sometimes men have a hard time hearing their wives. They need to hear it from somebody else. Please come back and talk to us. Please come back. Let me. I, I'm thinking she might have heard you wrong, and I want to know what you said. So he shows up, right? He shows back up, and he really says the same thing. Do not let her what? Do not let her drink wine. She's not to drink wine, and she is not to eat anything unclean. And he says, well, what will be his rule? What will be his work? And he says, again, for the mother. Would you think about this for just a moment? I, I've, just, I've really been pondering this passage this week about this. I think there's a good word here for parents. You see, the angel of the Lord didn't tell them what to do with Samson other than that he was the Nazarite vow. He didn't tell him how to train him up. He didn't tell him, train him up in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart. Parents train a child according to the bent, according to the each child, because every child is different. And there's not a cookie cutter way to raise one child. Every child is their own mold before God. But what he said is for mom to do what? Take care of herself. Really, in pondering this, I've been thinking about this this week, and I really think this. More importantly, in what we do with and how we do with our children is how we take care of ourselves. More important for our children is our integrity. More important for our children is what we do. How we take care of ourselves spiritually. How we take care of ourselves. How we walk with the Lord. More important than what we do with them is us. Proverbs says that a man of integrity, his children will be blessed after him. So I just throw that in for free. Now let's look. It said, the Bible says at the end of chapter 13 that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon, begins to move upon Samson. And in chapter 14, we have this. What do we have? We have Samson going down to Timnah. Wow. Okay. He's going down to Timnah. And he saw a woman in Timnah. Timnah of the daughter of the Philistines. So he went up and he told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah, the daughter of the Philistines. Now therefore get her for me as a wife. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. <laughs> They're laughing over here. Why, why are you laughing over there? What does that sound like to you all? Bossy? Spoiled. 
Sound like a spoiled child, does it? Almost in Walmart, you know, kicking and thrashing and throwing her away because they can't have that Hot Wheels car. You know, just having a big time, big throwing a big fit. And mom and dad try to talk him out of it, but no, I've got to have that woman. I've got to have her. Just very spoiled, right? Very, I want that. You know what else it is here? What, what else do we see here? I, I was telling the parents here just a little bit. We don't know. We don't know about the, lie, the childhood of Samson. We don't know. It's very vague. It's not there. So anything we do is speculation. But we can have hints there. And the hints here is what? Is that the parent begin to tell, the child begin to tell the parent what to do. And then the parent was what? Being obedient. You know what that's called? It's called codependency. What's code, what, what does it mean when you are codependent to your child? This is what it means. It means that you're not happy unless your child is happy with you. And when you take that stance, then what happens is the child becomes a manipulator and the child becomes the parent. And the parent's not. And then what do you have? What do you end up with? Where does that go? A spoiled child. You end up with a spoiled child. So is it fair to say? Is it fair to say then? Look, look, but I want you to see something. Look in verse 4 of chapter 14. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord. And he was, that he was seeking God, was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. So think about this. Now, it seems full. It seems wrong. But the scripture says that God was going to use this. Think about this with me. I don't believe it was right. God told them not to marry the Canaanite women. But, but in all fairness, the Philistines were not listed in that group that God gave them. Okay? They were not listed there. But in all fairness, the principle behind that was is that they would not marry a woman who worshipped another god. That was the principle behind all of that. That you do not marry a woman that worshipped another god. So I still have to believe that Samson was wrong here. I still had to believe that he was spoiled. But I do not believe that God calls Samson to sin. You see, for the book of James teaches us that we are what? We are not tempted by God, but we are led away of our own desires. So what do you believe then, Chris? I believe that God can use our mess for His will and purpose. I believe that God uses imperfect people to bring about His will. I believe that never can an imperfect person change the will of God. I believe He's got a purpose and a will. And He's got a plan. We may, let me describe it like this. Say our life is on a football field. I think this is a good description. I've thought about it often. But say our life is on a football field. What this, the heckler group over here. <laughs> okay. So we're on the football field. God's will is within the bounds of that football field, and we're not ever going to get off of it, but we may be all over that field. Our life may be from one end to the other, from one side to the other, but the fact is, is we've got some bounds and God's going to keep us within those bounds. So, so maybe Samson was spoiled, but the fact was, is God was working, right? 
God was working. And then he, he begins to come down to Timnah, and he gets surprised by this young lion that comes roaring against him. This lion comes roaring against him. You remember, Satan is described as a roaring lion who seeks to whom he may devour. So this lion comes roaring against him, and the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord come upon him, and he tore it. Can you just get a hold of this? He tore it like just... This is funny. This is funny. Watch what he says. It said that he mightily come upon him and he tore the line apart as one would have torn apart a young goat. I, wait, I want to see the young goat. <laughs> Forget the line. What are they tearing young goats apart for? And how are they tearing young goats apart? What, like a chicken or something? I don't know what the deal is. But then he's tearing this line. Just ripping him apart. Hey, you remember his Nazarite veil? He ain't supposed to what? Not be defiled by the dead, right? Okay. Look at this statement in verse 6. At the last sentence in verse 6. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. All right, hang on to that for just a minute. He goes down, he has a conversation with this woman, he goes back to his house, and then in verse 8, all that happens in verse 7, and then in verse 8, after some time when he returned to get her to come down for the marriage, he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. Okay, now why did he do this? This might be a little weird, okay? I need to go see what my strength did. I need to go see how bad I was. See what that line looks like. See if it's still laying there. I just need to go back and see the dead. I don't know what brought him back to it. Some weird guy thing, I can guarantee it. Okay? All right? So he comes back, and guess what's in the carcass of the line? Honeybees. Honeybees have built in the carcass of this lion, and he takes honey out of the lion, and he eats honey from this dead carcass. Now listen, maybe he killed the lion in protection, and he's all right, but I really have to believe that if you're eating honey out of a dead carcass, that probably you're not all right. Okay? And, and he takes the honey from there, and he eats it, and then he goes to where? And then he goes, and he gives some to mom and dad. But then look at what it says. In verse 9, the last sentence. But he did not tell them. Thank you, honey. Thank you. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. He didn't tell them he killed it. And he didn't tell them where he got the honey from. Why don't you think he's being honest with his parents? Probably going to be in trouble, isn't he? Probably withholding some information, right? So would it be fair to say not only was Samson deceitful, not only was Samson spoiled, but that Samson, maybe he was deceitful as well? But in his spoiledness, was, is it also fair to say that God was working? Was it also fair to say that in his deceitfulness that the Spirit of God was performing things through him that was miraculous and tearing that line apart? So God is working. So they come to the marriage feast, and it's seven days long. The marriage is going to be seven days. And they come there, and they begin to share. They begin to talk. And they, and they bring him 30 companions, 30 pals. And Samson decides at this point, man, it's my marriage week. I've got some friends. I feel like a little gambling. This guy ought to have been a Baptist pastor. He's spoiled, he's deceitful, and now he's gambling. He's my kind of man. Yeah, really. And, and you know, he comes up with a riddle. And he says to him, if you can solve this riddle in seven days, I'll give you 30 shirts. If you can't solve it in seven days, you have to give me seven shirts. And look at the riddle. 
The riddle is, out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong comes something sweet. Huh. Has something to do with the line. What happens, though? The seventh day comes, and they can't figure the riddle out, so they're in panic mode. So they go to who? They go to the wife. And they tell the wife, either you find out what the riddle is, or we will burn you in your father's house. So, whether she did it through love, sweet whispers in his ear, or whether she did it through nagging, whichever way she accomplished her task and found out what the riddle was. And when she found out, she let the guys know. And the guys come to him, and they say, We know what the riddle is. What is sweeter than honey, and what is stronger than a lion? And he said this famous statement, You have not, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. If you had not plowed with my heifer, what did he mean? What's a heifer? I asked Matt Mitchell this morning. Matt Mitchell, what's a heifer? Chandler, tell me what a heifer is. Female cow before it gives birth. Not yet had a baby. All right? If you had not plowed with my heifer, you would... But then watch verse 19. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon, and he killed 30 of their men. Now listen, this is still all... Fal Philistines, there's five lords, and this was, one, this was one of the areas that a different lord ruled over. And he killed 30 of their men, he took their apparel, and he gave the changes of clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Look at this. He just lost a bet. He's lost a gambling wage, but he ain't going to pay up. He's going to go down and kill 30 guys, leave them naked, bring their clothes back to the guys that he lost the bet to. Golly, he's building a resume, isn't he? It's a nice one. <laughs> you got to love Samson, don't you? But the Spirit of God came upon him. Well, i got to remind you of verse 4 of chapter 13. No, verse 4 of chapter 14. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord that he was seeking for an occasion to move against the Philistines. This wife, this wife was what God was using in order to begin his attack and deliverance from the Philistines. This riddle, this gambling, this mess that God is still using... And the, and the attack began. But then watch this. Then after the attack, it says that, so his anger was aroused and he went back to his father's house. His anger, he was just so mad. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best friend. Maybe not only is he spoiled, maybe not only is he deceptive, but maybe... He has anger issues. That he's so mad at her over her giving away the riddle that he won't take her back to his house as he should have. But he left her. Being spoiled, being deceitful, having an issue with anger and his temper, yet God is still what? God is still using him. Wow. Whew, seems crazy, huh? Does it seem crazy? Then in chapter 15, the Bible says after a while, oh, I've got like seven minutes to do two chapters. Y'all okay? <clears throat> after a while, in the time of the wheat heart, <clears throat> I shouldn't have done that. <clears throat> it happened that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. <clears throat> After a period of time. After. 
He's mad and left her. He gets over it. <clears throat> He's finished. And he says, what? I'm going to go get my wife. And he brings a young goat as an offering. It's a nice engagement ring for all you guys who are about to get married. A young goat's a perfect engagement ring. Just bring the baby on. But the dad says, hang on a minute. There's an issue. I thought you hated my daughter, so I give her to your companion. But you can have my younger daughter. This didn't go well for Samson, so Samson did something really crazy. Remember, it's in the time of the harvest. The fields are ready to be taken. The fields really are dry and bristly. They're ready to be harvested. So Samson catches 300 foxes. Man, how long did that take? 300 foxes. He ties them tail to tail, <clears throat> puts a torch on them, lights them, and sends 150 pairs through the fields. Set them on fire, destroy them, reap havoc. Can you imagine the chaos, the mess? It's awful, isn't it? <clears throat> Watch this. <clears throat> When it's all said and done, they say, who done this? Who's responsible for this? Well, it's that wife of Samson. It's her family. They give her to somebody else. They didn't let her have him. So guess what they do? Watch this. They go and burn her and her father. You see it? So they, so the, in verse 6, so the Philistines came up and they burned her and her father with fire. What was the threat about the riddle? If, if you don't tell us, we're going to what? I'll tell you something, guys. It really is real that we reap what we sow. It really will come to pass. So she's dead. <clears throat> and he's ready to fight. He's ready to do battle. He goes to this certain place. And the men of Judah, the men of Judah come to him and they say, Samson, you've got to quit. They are over us. They are our authority. We are their slaves. You, Samson, stop. We're going to arrest you. He says, don't kill me. He says, I'm not going to kill you, but we're going to tie you up. We're going to place you on this rock, and we're just going to let them have you because you're causing us too much trouble, too much pain. <clears throat> So they take new ropes and they bound him and they set him upon the rock. I don't know whether you can really use that, but it'd be really good to think about when you're set upon a rock. <laughs> the rock of Christ. <laughs> Listen, there ain't much can faze you. So he's on the rock and he's tied up with new ropes. And the Philistines, they come and they're coming to do battle and they're shouting. And he burst. He burst out of those ropes like they were nothing. And he finds the jawbone of a donkey. And he kills a thousand men. Think about that. Not with a gun. Not with a bow and arrow. I'm talking about the jawbone of a donkey. If that donkey's that big... He's killed a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. Why? Over who? That wife who he said, I got to have. Right? God used that to bring defeat to who? Philistines. So then after that is done, in verse 18 of this chapter, it says, Then he become very thirsty. 
And so he cried out to the Lord and said, man, this is really the first place you see Samson really crying out to the Lord, really showing any need. You see the Spirit of God coming upon him, but you don't really see him until this time crying out. And he's crying out to the Lord, God, and this is, listen to what he says, some things that's important. He said, you have given me this great deliverance. First of all, is he says he recognizes that he just killed these thousand men and it wasn't his strength. Maybe that's why he went back to the lion's carcass because he's trying to figure out how he done that. So he's recognizing at this point that this is not me doing this stuff. This is God who is on me doing this stuff. So you have delivered me. You have brought this great deliverance by my hand. Watch this. Your servant. Your servant. Would you get this, that he may be spoiled, he may be deceitful, he may have anger issues, he may even be a little revengeful, but he is God's servant. He is God's servant. And the Bible said that, that, that Israel, that he judged Israel 20 years in the day of the Philistines. Now the last chapter, stay with me, okay? Chapter 16. Now Samson went to Gaza, and he saw a harlot there, and he went into her. Okay? All right, we're building upon something. I hope you're going to begin to recognize it. And they found out that he was there and where she was at, so they lay in wait, and they're going to kill him in the morning. But then Samson finds out what they're doing, and at midnight he rises up, and he takes the doors of the gates of the city and the two posts, pulls them up, the bar and all, and he puts them on his shoulder and carries them to the top of the hill. John Curson, who I listened to, who's a preacher out in Colorado, he said this. He said, everybody's got Samson pictured as, a, as like Mr. Atlas or some bodybuilder. And he said, I just think that's completely wrong. He said, I think that Samson looked like every other man, and it wasn't until the Spirit of God come upon him that he had extraordinary strength. It was nothing to do with his physique. So he carries this all the way up. And then what do we see next? Then we see, watch, and I'm going to move quickly. So Delilah said to Samson, please tell me where your great strength lies. Wait a minute, I need to back up, to, first of all, to be sure that we see verse 4. Afterward, it happened that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek whose name was Delilah. Let me just go ahead and say, Samson's downfall was relationships. Samson had an issue with a relationship. His first wife, give him over. Then he's in with a harlot, trying to get her back. Now he's with, loves this woman named Delilah. It didn't take the enemy long to figure out what his weakness was. And it doesn't take the enemy long to figure out what our weakness is. And so the enemy, so the lords of the Philistines did this. The lords of the Philistines paid her 1,100 pieces of silver. You realize Jesus was only sold for 30. 1,100 pieces of silver if you can figure out where his strength lies. So was it whispers in his ear? Was it a touch of the knee or was it a nag? I don't know, but she began. She began working on her husband or on her boyfriend, whatever they are at this time. And she began working on him and she began to say, hang on, she said. What is your strength? Tell me your strength. And he first tells her, well, maybe it's the fresh bowstrings. So they tied him up with fresh bowstrings, but it didn't work. It didn't hold him. She said, that wasn't it. Tell me what it is. He said, it's new ropes. So they tied him up with new ropes, and that didn't hold him. She said, please, tell me what it is. He said, put my hair, weave it in a loom. And that didn't work. She said, you're making a fool of me. You don't really love me. You know all the words. What is it? He says, I am a Nazarite from my birth. 
Never has my hair been cut. If you cut my hair, you'll take away my strength. Now listen to me. I want you to get this. Samson's strength was not in his hair. Samson's strength was in his dedication to the God he served. Samson's strength was in the Spirit of God that come upon him. And when he revealed to her exactly what his strength was, he chose that relationship before God. When he chose that relationship before God, the Bible says that he, that God departed from him and he did not know it. We dealt with that last week. Remember, when God departs from us, it really is his wrath. He gives us over. He departs from us. The wrath of God is poured out on us. The ultimate picture of departure is on the cross. When Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's the ultimate picture of departure. That's the ultimate picture of the wrath of God being poured out. And the wrath was poured out and He departed. And they come to Him and they got Him. And it's interesting, in a time when every man does what is right in their own eyes, in a time when every man thinks for himself and not allowing Christ to think for them. In a time when every man does what is right in their own eyes, do you know what they do first to him? They pluck his eyes out. Jesus said, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. You know what he was saying? You're not seeing right. Billy Sanders is one of my, just a dear friend to me. I love him with all of my heart. Some of y'all know Billy, some of you don't. Billy was sitting in the Camel County Jail. Billy has a glass eye in his left eye from a car wreck. Good eye on his right side. On his left arm, Billy had a tattoo of a cross. On his right arm, Billy had a tattoo of a naked woman. And he was sitting in that jail cell and God spoke to Billy and said, Billy, your problem is, is the only thing you see is the things of the world. What's on the right side? Only in your own mind. I need you to see the cross. I need you to see what Jesus did. I need you to see the gospel. But right now you're blinded to it. What God did to Billy is the same thing that God did to Samson is he blinded Billy to the things of the world so that he could see the cross. Samson was blinded to the things of the world so that he could see clearly God's purpose. So in his being spoiled, in his being deceitful, in his being revengeful, in his heated anger, in, in his problem with women... With relationships, let me say relationships because women have struggled with men. In the problem with relationships, Samson ends up blinded and grinding. They used him to grind the meal for the enemy. Like a mule or a donkey or a horse would, they used Samson to grind. And then they throw this great party. Stay with me. I'm almost finished. They throw this great party. All five lords of the Philistines are there. Everybody's there. And they say, bring Samson out and let us, let him perform for us. Let's see how strong he is. Let's see how awesome he is. Bring him out. And they're up above and they're looking down. And a man who could do everything is now being led by a young child. And he asked that child as he's being led, he asked that child, he said, will you just lead me to the supports of this building? Will you just lead me to where the main supports are? Put my hands on them. 
And he put his hands on them. And for the second time that we know of, he prayed again to the Father. And he said, Father, one more time, one more time will you remember me. One more time will you strengthen me that I can have revenge for my eyes, that I can destroy them. Let me die with them. And God strengthened him again. And he pushed the foundation out from underneath that building and it all collapsed. And Samson died. And the five lords of the Philistines died. And the Bible said that more died in his death than in his life. I don't know what your past is. I don't know what your present is. I don't know what your future is. But this is what I know, is that God has a plan for your life. And God uses imperfect people to perform His will. And just because we're imperfect does not mean we're going to mess His will up. God is sovereign. You know that verse, Romans eight twenty eight. All things. Not good things, not my talents, all things, even my sinfulness, even my ugliness. All things work together to good for those who love God, who are what? Called according to His purpose. Wow. Many times we've got a situation to where we're what? Man, I'm struggling with selfishness. I'm struggling with relationships. I'm struggling with deceitfulness. God can't use me. God, keep pressing forward. God uses imperfect people to perform His will. Father, thank You for this time. Thank You for Your blessings. Thank You for the music today. It was just a blessing to my soul. And I thank You for that. Thank you for your word. Thank you for Samson. Thank you for the book of Judges. Father, we pray now as we go, Father, that, Father, we'll go in your name and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.